What's up guys, it's Dullmatter here, and today we're going to be reacting to the newest History Matters video. He actually just dropped this one about an hour ago. Uh, why did Russia conquer Siberia? Um, so I imagine my two guesses on this are one, well I guess it's probably a bit of both honestly. One, colonialism was very in at the time, right, it was the thing. Uh, just conquer as much land as you could. I mean, it was pretty much the status quo for most of human history until the last 50 or 60 years or so. I guess 70 years really since the end of World War II. Uh, and then two, I'm guessing, has a lot to do with just the geography of Russia, right? Uh, obviously, they're on the Eurasian plain. You can basically go from one end to the other without any issues, and therefore, you know, that's good for Russia to expand, and at the same time, it, you know, shores up their borders so that they can't get invaded as easily, you know, like they were invaded by the Mongols and such. Um, so yeah, let's uh, get into this. Link to the original video down below. Remember to like, comment, subscribe to help the algorithm, and uh, let's go. Russia, as you'll be aware, is huge, growing from a medium-sized state in the mid-16th century to this in the mid-1700s. Most of these lands are in what's called Siberia, which were difficult to govern due to their sheer size and place Russia in contact with more potential rivals. As su <laughs> they don't care. Such, this raises the question, why did Russia conquer Siberia? What did it have to gain from doing so? Well, it won't surprise you to know that the primary reason- oh, They had like a, a single frame there of like an oil well. So. Well, it won't. Yeah, they, they, did you guys catch that? It looked like an oil well. Doing so. Well, it won't surprise you to know. That oh yeah, yeah. Well, well, I get it. I get it. That took me a second to get it. Cash, yo. Primary reason was money. As of the reign of Ivan the Terrible, Moscow's lifeblood was trade, often in furs. These were sourced from the neighboring lands and states, which often came into conflict with Moscow. In 1552, Ivan conquered the Khanate of Kazan, and soon afterwards, the Astrakhan Khanate. I guess it kind of makes sense, because if you think about it, like, look at how the English and French, you know, kind of spread across the North American continent. So much of that was over fur trade, right? You had, like, the French fur trading companies, the English fur trading companies. Uh, probably most famous, Hudson Bay Company, which, uh, you know, they're often just called HBC now. They make a lot of clothing. They own a lot of stores. Um, it's one of the oldest companies in the world, or oldest still existing companies in the world. Uh, I think it was founded in like the early 1600s and it's still around today. But yeah, fur, fur used to be a big deal. Uh, obviously partially out of necessity and then also partially out of fashion. These conquests were both primarily to give Moscow control of the Volga River and thus the region's trade routes. So with the economic life of saved Moscow you. <laughs> secured along with some new fancy farmland and peasants there to tax, why did Ivan and his successors push for more? Well, Ivan sent a man called Yermak Timoveyevich to lead an army of Cossacks to pacify the neighboring states. And he Every Russian name needs to end in itch or of. It's like a rule. I wonder what that means, because I, I wonder if it, like... I don't know enough about the Slavic languages, but I know like in Germanic languages you often see like the ending sun from the and a lot of those have to do with like pre-Christian times when uh, we had more traditional naming methods. Like you still see this in Iceland, where uh, you know so like my name is Jesse. If I had a son, it would be you know whatever I name him, Jesse's son. Uh, so that's where like Thompson comes from. It means Tom's son. Uh, you know all these different names with son, right? Hansen. Uh, trying to think of some more off the top of my head. But you, you get the drift, right? That's really common in Germanic naming. I wonder if there's something, you know, kind of similar in uh, Slavic languages. You see the same thing in, in the Celtic languages with the O suffix, or I guess prefix, uh, you know, the O prefix. It's like O Mali, O Hani, you know, all these different names. It means of, right? It's the same thing as the sun thing. I wonder if that's where the of and the itch just come from. He did this for two reasons. The first was to prevent raiding into Moscow's territories, and the second was to extract tribute in the form of furs which would then be sold on to Europe. After the Russians conquered Siberia, from which Siberia gets its name, there was little in the way of organized resistance left, which as a result meant that it only- Yeah, because when there's 12 people there, they can't really organize a resistance, right? Just taking over all this like mostly uninhabited land, and the, the few tribes that are there have like incredibly small populations. And they're, they're not very advanced because of where they live and how, you know, removed they are from the rest of the world. I mean, technically, like, they're connected to the Eurasian landmass, but there's so much empty territory out there and so much of it's useless that, well, useless with the technology at the time, I should say. A lot of it's really good land now because of all the oil and minerals they have there, but, like, we didn't really use that back then. It only took 60 years for Moscow to conquer all of this. And it made its way there because, frankly, nobody could stop them. <laughs> the Tsars of Russia, expansion only had upside. Free land. Siberia was cheap to govern because it basically wasn't governed. 
Russia planted trading posts and small fortresses along the frontier, which existed to protect roads and river crossings from raiders. As for most of the people who lived in Siberia, many had little idea that they now lived in a place called Russia. In fact, in much of Siberia's north, Russian influence was basically non-existent, and some parts of it wouldn't be fully mapped until the Soviet Union carried out its censuses. It's just- Man, that's kind of crazy, because that wasn't even until the... Like, you're talking, well, the Russian Revolution happened in 1917. I can't, I don't remember when the Russian Civil War was over. But yeah, it would have been by the, like, it would have been after the Civil War ended, so. That's kind of crazy. I guess we did have kind of the same thing in Canada, right? Like, a lot of that was not really, like, what was up north wasn't really understood until the ni late 18, early 1900s. It's kind of crazy. Same with, like, Antarctica, right? Like, we didn't really go down to Antarctica until the like, 18 and 1900s. Like, the age of exploration, it feels so long ago, but realistically, like, your grandparents or your great-grandparents were probably alive for, like, the end of it. Just that the Russians claimed it and the people who made the maps weren't exactly going to argue with it. Sounds them. fair. Eventually, the Russians would run into a major power which wanted to expand into the region, the Qing Dynasty. When they first came into contact, the Qing were quick to shoot at the Russians until... Try murder. The local leaders continued fighting until leadership in Moscow formally sued for peace. It was agreed that in return for some limited trade access, Russia would renounce any claim to these lands and acknowledge Qing ownership. Man, Russia has a history of getting its ass kicked in border disputes. Like, they... You know, we're talking about, like, Europe. Europe's in, like, its massive ascendancy at this point, right? They lose to the Japanese. They lose to the Chinese. Um, th they didn't do well against Finland. They didn't do well against Germany. I mean, the, the, you know, they're a giant country. Mostly because they took over a bunch of, like, fucking people that were, like, basically tribal. But they, they really don't do that well in war. You know, they, even in World War II, I know a lot of people give them, like... There's, like, this whole, like, I guess you could call it, like, Soviet revisionist history you see online of, like, basically everyone saying the Soviets won World War II. And they talk about how, you know, so many Soviet men died. And it's like, yeah, that was literally part of the British and American strategy in that war was to let the Soviets throw as many men as they could at it. Because they wanted to weaken the Soviet Union just in case they got into a conflict with them after. It, it's, it's really, when you actually, like, get into the, like, nitty gritty on some of those details, it's kind of funny. But... And, and, like, a lot of their industry was basically, like, devised by the Americans to help them in the war. And yeah, when you, when you get really down to it, like, the Americans, and, you know, this hurts me as a Canadian to say, but the Americans definitely were the biggest contributing factor in that war, like, undeniably. After both sides had agreed, it wasn't long before the Russians took everything to the north. Again, this was because nothing was stopping them, and it's not like it cost the government much to do so. Just also, Russia is now about 20 times as large as it had been a century prior, and its sheer size and by extension prestige was one of the reasons that European leaders acknowledged Russian Tsars becoming Russian emperors. When China would later find itself on the receiving end of European imperial policy, Russia was quick to capitalize, and it took the lands it had previously been denied, meaning that the country would stretch all the way from the Baltic Sea in the west to the Sea of Japan in the east. They still own that, too. Lost a bunch, you know, in the Central Asia region, lost a, lost a bunch out here, but they they still own that, and they actually gained uh, some islands down here after World War II. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and a special thanks to my patrons, James Bizanet, Kelly Moneymaker, Sky Chappelle, Corsho Wolf, Jerry Lambden. I'm actually, great video, but I'm actually kind of disappointed they didn't talk about, like, the ge geographic necessity for, like, defense. Maybe that didn't become an issue until later on. Maybe I'm thinking about, like, later in history. But, you know, when you read a lot of, like, ge when you watch a lot of, like, geopol geopolitical videos, they always talk about how, you know, Russia's always needed to expand in both east and west in order to shore up its defenses because it's on the Eurasian plain. It's this flat plain. And obviously during, like, that period in history, um, you know, whether it be horses or tanks, right, pretty much anything before airplanes and missiles, you know, you can't, f you can't ride a horse over the mountain. You can't drive a tank over the mountain. I mean, I guess you could, but it'd be a pain in the ass. The logistics become a pain in the ass. So for Russia, it was always, you know, beneficial to expand as far as it could to, into the Eurasian plane. That way, they'd have less enemies on the Eurasian plane and less, uh, you know, of less enemies that are actually able to attack them. But let me know what you think below. Uh, you know, maybe I'm wrong there. Maybe that didn't become an issue until later in history. Although I, I guess it had to be an issue then because the Mongols. That's how they took over. Uh, and I mean, even the original Indo-European expansions came off of that Eurasian plane. The Turks. So many expansions. So yeah, that would have been an issue back then. But let me know what you think. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.